There's also these new physics discoveries that keep leaking out, and they always relate to sacred geometry. The idea in this case of the dodecahedron, which is 12 pentagonal faces that kind of looks like a soccer ball if you make it into a sphere. They actually found out, uh, these scientists uh, discovered that the background radiation from when the universe was first created has arranged itself into this odd geometric pattern. And that's been proven. So then the question is, okay, what is the force that would cause that type of geometry to emerge in the formation of the universe? As we're going into the 2012 subject, of course, crop circles have been on everybody's mind. This was the formation that came down a couple years ago, which started out in an unfinished way. You notice that all of these blocks are completely solid, and this area is solid as well. Well, the circle makers, whoever they are, came back. And when they came back, this is what we got. Now you have time markings and symbols from the Mayan calendar, okay? And the alignment of these winged disks in terms of what markers they're pointing to, which corresponds to the Mayan system and the Aztec system, gave you an exact time reference of the length of time between when this was created and 2012, the end of the Mayan calendar. So this is a self-referential 2012 diagram given to us by whoever is behind the circle phenomenon. This is uh, one of many crop circles which seems to suggest that the secret to understanding 2012 and this mystery that we're dealing with right here in our talk today is in vibration. That looks an awful lot like a vibrating puddle of liquid. This is what happens when you take vibration to the next step. You get sacred geometry, and I'm going to show you more about that in a second. If you can imagine, this is a sphere and a cube and then another sphere. This is the Froxfield chromosome formation. Obviously, the circle makers are saying, you know, 2012, pay attention to your DNA, right? Except here's the thing. The chromosome's all broken up. And that's what happens before there's about to be a cell metamorphosis. Now, this is even more interesting. Check this out. What does that look like to you? A double helix. Okay, and there's 12 stations. Then down here, you get an even weirder thing. You get a triple helix, but they still have that, that same formation. And then, boom, what's this? And look at the timelines. This is less than a month apart in 1999. And this came out in 96. So it appears that there is a message being given about the basic nature of DNA changing somehow. This is another crop formation which shows you DNA very, very clearly. As you can see that it's twisting and you can see the ladder and the helixes. So there's something very interesting going on here. Now this is one of the most staggering formations that's ever come down. So this is showing you the geometry of the tetrahedron, uh, which here's a, a drawing of it. This is the frozen vibration that is one of the principal energy fields that moves through planets, as you can see in this diagram, all throughout the solar system. So here's the secret. This is just a puddle of water that's got ordinary particles of sand in it called colloids. And those colloids are then vibrated on perfect sound frequencies like the white keys on the piano. And what you get is this interesting geometric shape inside, which should look pretty familiar to us by now. So uh, this is the same pile of sand in the same water, just with different sound frequencies. And this is a very important point we're going to get into soon. The fact is that you can crank up the sound to a different frequency, and you get the same stable geometry. It stays there. It doesn't move. And when you crank it back down, it goes back to the other shape. So these shapes remain consistent for the given volume of water that you have and the shape of that water regardless of how many times you change your frequencies. And it's also important to notice that the density of the structure, the density of the geometry gets higher as the pitch goes higher. These are increasing pitches as you go down. So that's a very important point. So what if physical matter was actually built like this? What if this is the secret of physical matter? Could that mean that atoms and molecules as we know them could fundamentally shift? That's what we're looking at. As I was training you into seeing yesterday, is there a parallel reality where space and time flip over, where they invert with each other? And the answer is yes. That's actually what is going on. Uh, does this solve all the basic quantum physics problems? It does. And that's been proven. goes back to the two-slit experiment, where you have single electrons that move through two slits, but then they form an interference pattern of more than two slits on the other side, which is like a wave. So here you have a particle, but over here you have a wave, and you can even have multiple strikes at the same time. So atoms and, and electrons are not little bitty chunks of matter. They're just energy. But they're not behaving the way they should. So here's another diagram of that. This is what a wave does. You, a wave is just like if there was a liquid here, and then it hits this, it ripples like, like two waves on a pond coming together, and that's how you get your interference pattern. So of course, wave-particle duality. Um, what we're discussing now is the idea that a particle is here in space-time, 
That's where it's uh, fixed in time but can move around in space. But in the inverted world, it can, it's spread out in time. So it's still the same thing. It's just that it's now flipped over into another domain. And in that other domain, it space, spaces out in time, and thus you get this kind of waveform that's created from it. Well, this would all be just kind of an interesting intellectual study until you start looking at larger objects. Now, check this out. This is a little thing called a buckyball or a fullerene. It's uh, carbon molecules, 60 of them put together. Obviously, this is a solid piece of matter. In fact, they're used to store items inside of them. They can be used for, like, uh, disaster cleanups, like oil spills eventually. If they could manufacture enough of them, that kind of thing would be great for that. Well, Zellinger in 1999 took these carbon-60 molecules and shot them at a 100 nanometer diffraction grating, which is a little slit like we showed you before, and he got an interference pattern, which is like a wave. So do you realize what that means? The buckyballs were rolling inside out somehow. They hit that wall, and they turned over. Like, if, have you ever had one of, those, uh, one of those little balloons where you squeeze it in your hand and it goes whoosh? Is everybody with me? That's what seems to be happening with physical matter, and I've heard that from black ops people as well. This is performed in Austria. So this little guy popped into all these waves when he hit the wall because he flipped inside out. Now, what's really interesting about the geometry that we're already showing you, like the geometry at the formation of the universe, is that they also can do this. But they do this in a very interesting way. When these geometries flip inside out, this is the opposite that they form. So when you have the dodecahedron, it forms the icosahedron. The tetrahedron flips into another tetrahedron upside down. And then the octahedron flips over into a cube, and it goes back and forth between those two. Now, here's what's another very fascinating point. We've just seen how the fullerene can burst into a wave. Well, guess what? DNA is almost the same width. Now, just chew on that for a second if you haven't already seen this talk. I mean, DNA is supposed to be a molecule. In fact, the amount of DNA in one cell of your body, if you spaced it out, is five feet long. It's five feet tall. So there's a lot of DNA in there. But if DNA can turn into a wave, and that opens the door to all these quantum non-locality principles. All of a sudden, that stuff becomes real. It becomes true. Well, we already have plenty of experimental evidence, and I'm just going to show you one of them right for now. This is Kaznachiev, a Russian scientist, who passed uh, a diseased cell culture through a shield here, which, when it was glass, there was no effect. Of course, the other culture was just healthy tissue. But then when he passed through quartz, the quartz allowed the disease to be transmitted to the healthy cells here. So you have disease to healthy. Well, a virus, again, is a little tiny thing. Most viruses are shaped like geometry. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, a virus can turn into a wave. Okay. So there are some people who believe, for example, that AIDS is synthetic and that you can actually activate the dormant virus with a wave. Uh, it is important to remember that your consciousness has more power than any wave that could ever be beamed at you. So if you ever start worrying about electromagnetic mind control or all these silly things that people get focused on, that's something that you don't need to worry about. So Dewey Larson, the physicist, uh, revealed that time is, in fact, a three-dimensional domain. And this is where we're getting into the idea of what's over there on the other side when you flip over a particle and it turns into a wave. There's a three-dimensional realm where time, as we know it, is spaced out. Now, OK, not everybody's following me on this, but we're going to go into how this works, so just stay with me. Einstein talked about the space-time fabric. And the basic idea about gravity is that planets are like dipping down in this fabric, and then gravity is just the result of things rolling towards the planet as the fabric is displaced. Well, think about it. If this were true, and all the planets are sitting on top of this fabric, that means that only the fabric and what's above it represents the realm that we live in. But then you got this whole place on the bottom. And where is that? And how do we get there? Well, the answer is you got to punch a hole through. So that's your wormhole, right? You know, the word wormhole comes from the idea of a worm burrowing through an apple. Everybody remember that? And it's like the outside of the apple is space-time. The inside of the apple, where the wormhole goes, is time space. That's a three-dimensional realm of time. Time is not linear. It's only linear because we're stuck in space-time. So what happens is time, time space is on the inside 
of the apple, or the donut in this case, and space-time is on the outside. But this whole system can invert so that space-time is now on the inside and time-space is on the outside. So here's the basics of it again. Three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. You can move around in space, but you're fixed in time. It's moving forward like a river. When you go into time-space, what we would think of as time is now three-dimensional, and what we would think of as space is now one-dimensional. You actually move around in three dimensions of time. This is where we're having dreams. What really appears to be happening here is everybody knows about the system of chakras, the esoteric system of chakras. The chakras are actually different levels of your soul and different levels of where your thought processes and consciousness processes are happening. Um, so as you go through these kundalini meditations, the idea is that you're supposed to raise the kundalini serpent. I was shown in multiple readings that the actual process of raising that kundalini is collapsing the chakras together into this set of nested spheres. Because when you do that, you focus everything into the one spot in your brain that we're going to go to here. So this is bringing all your chakras together and then finding that channel so that the, the entity that's trying to reach you or your higher self can get to the center because the center is where all the action happens. Why is that? Well, the center of your brain has a small gland in it called the pineal gland, which as you can see here, it was called pineal because it's shaped like a pine cone. This is the exact geometric center of your brain. It's right here. And this, as we're going to see, is very important in ancient cultures. The Sumerians gave it a description, uh, which you can see here, the, the little uh, acorns on the top of this staff that he had. And there's also a little, a little jobber up here. Uh, and what we found out from uh, Dan Burrish is that these can be reversed. The cylinder seals can be flipped over, and when you start doing that, you see some very interesting things, like the eye in the triangle, and another eye in the triangle right here. So the Sumerians were hiding information. They were encrypting information in these seals. So this is the one we were just looking at. Here's your little pineal gland, and the other one up there. But it gets a lot more direct as we go on. And you're going to start wondering to yourself, why in the world are all these cultures focusing on the pine cone? This is Osiris, the lord of the underworld in Egyptian mythology. This is his staff, which as we now know, this is the raising kundalini, the serpent. But it also represents DNA. And there on the top, as the kundalini rises, what are they looking at? They're looking at the pine cone. That's the junction point where all this energy comes together. So. The pineal gland has been explained through conventional methods, conventional means, to some degree. Uh, they have figured out what it does by looking at how when light strikes your retina, there's a little nerve system here called the preganglion sympathetic neurons. And they move through, and the light transitions itself into your pineal gland. Okay. When the light goes off, it signals electromagnetically to the pineal gland that it's time to go to sleep, which then secretes melatonin into your cerebrospinal fluid, which activates the whole brain's sleep mechanism, the whole nervous system. Okay, So the pineal gland is very much associated with going to sleep. Well, that makes sense because when you go into a mystical state of consciousness, typically you have to go into a very meditative, very zoned out, very relaxed Zen type of consciousness. That's not an accident. So again, if therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. So when you cut off the light on the outside, the light opens up on the inside. That's the melatonin mechanism. Well, the pineal gland is activated when light goes out. Jesus also said the people who sat, sat in darkness saw a great light, Matthew 14, Matthew 4.16. Again, the idea that it's only when, you, when the light goes out and you can activate your pineal gland that you have the full access to this knowledge. So the pineal gland also secretes another chemical. This is more recent research called dimethyltryptamine, or DMT. Uh, it's becoming increasingly popular in the New Age circuit now that people are taking these South American potions like Yopo and Ayahuasca, which is the one you're probably more familiar with. Uh, the actual dictionary definition of what DMT does is that it includes profound time dilation, Time travel, this is when you're accessing the time field, right? Time is three-dimensional. It's no longer linear. You can shift time. Journeys to paranormal realms, that's like those fairy circles, the gnome circles, right? And encounters with spiritual beings or other mystical trans-dimensional modalities. 
All right, so there's the, the shape of it once again. Now, what's the big secret? The interior is filled with water. How does that seem like a big secret? Who cares? Why would it matter that there's water inside the pineal gland? Well, those of you who were here yesterday know the answer. Um, the interior of the pineal gland, the water flips in and out through time space. We'll get to that in a second. The problem that most people are having is that the water calcifies as you age. In fact, that's how they're able to figure out if your brain has a tumor when you're getting an MRI. Most people have this chunk of calcium in the center of their brain which looks white on the MRI or on an x-ray. And if that little guy is off to one side, why is that? Think about it. Because what? Tumor is pushing on the brain and it knocks it off of alignment. So our pineal gland is actually supposed to be used for transdimensional access, but instead what's happening is that we're calcifying it by our diet, by the use of fluoride in our toothpaste, fluoride in our water, by the drinking too much soda, carbonated beverages, uh, too much uh, refined fats, refined sugars, refined flours, white flour. So the water becomes your conduit to time space, the parallel reality, and then your interior retina in your third eye, because you actually do have three, records the visual images. That's what all the ancient cultures painted the bindi on their forehead for. DMT seems to accelerate the activity. LSD and other psychedelics force the pineal to release DMT. It's potentially dangerous, so I'm not recommending you go out and start tripping because your pineal can get stuck on even when you're awake. And that's the actual nature of schizophrenia, delusions, and waking hallucinations. There have been multiple studies that have been done proving that shamanic visionary experiences and schizophrenic hallucinatory experiences are almost identical. What the ancient shamans have happened to them is just about the same as what happens to schizos. It's just that the schizo is cracked, that the, the walnut is cracked, as I call it, or the acorn, or the pine cone, right? Um, if you have some of that electrical activity that doesn't know when to shut off, which could be also the melatonin, right? When the melatonin kicks out, it's telling you to go to sleep. That's what starts to fire up this engine. It's only when the DMT kicks out a little bit that the engine goes into full steam. But that's usually only after you fall asleep. But as you start to fall asleep, the melatonin starts to rev up the engine. Well, a schizophrenic doesn't get enough sleep. That's one of the things that every study has shown about schizophrenia. They are insomniacs. So if you do that enough, then melatonin more and more will start to uh, be synthesized while you're awake and it starts to open your gateway and you start getting these hallucinations. So DMT is what's cracking that protection of keeping it electromagnetically dormant while you're awake. So it does very much look like the pineal gland is a natural hypergate. Now here's another interesting thing. Uh, a colleague of mine discovered that the eardrum inside the ear is tilted on a weird angle. That's not straight up and down like you'd think it would be or that you normally would imagine. It's tilted, and it actually tilts forward like this. So the eardrums look like this inside your head. Okay? What he found was that he could build microphones that had this orientation, like where they are in your head, and he gets a three-dimensional recording. So if I were to take one of these mics and put it here in the room, and then somebody ran over through the back screaming, and then we take his speakers, because he built holographic speakers, and you pop the speakers right there in the same exact room, and you press play on the tape recording, you're going to hear that person running behind the room as if they were there. You get a holographic sound. Now it makes sense, right? If light can be holographic, light is a vibration, why couldn't you do exactly the same thing with sound? This is how it's done. It's done by reverse engineering the way your ears already work, because the human ear has a better three-dimensional tracking system than any other creature. The only creature that even comes close is the owl which obviously for the hunting purposes. So we have a very unique hyperdimensional mechanism, and he actually also found that, the, that the, these uh, lobes of the, of the inner ear here are corresponding in the geometric angles to the uh, Great Pyramid, the angles and slope of the Great Pyramid. So this is what happens. They're coplanar with a tetrahedron inside your head, the point of which comes out through the third eye center. And of course, the third eye is at the geometric center of this. So when you're going into the pineal gland, when you're falling asleep, you're going to lie down. You're going to tilt your head like this. Which way is the, is the tetrahedron pointing now? Which way is the triangle going to be? Like this, right? And your eye is in the center. 
So doesn't that look a lot like this? So this is the secret, okay? There, there is a secret that has been kept right in front of our eyes. Nobody understands it. And again, as I said yesterday, I'm actually releasing this information for the first time. No one has ever made this public before. This is from deep in the black ops stuff. And I only was able to put the whole thing together from seven different witness testimonies that all correlated independently of each other. That's how I found out that it's from the pineal gland. I'm not sure that they would want anybody to know this. So I am taking a risk at revealing this, but that's why I did it publicly first.